Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we are having a look at some fascinating pieces of early radio technology. These are what are known as crystal radios and these were the primary means of listening to commercial radio broadcasts up until the late 1920s and early 1930s when they were largely superseded by more advanced tube-based receivers. And those of you who are longtime viewers of the channel and are starting to get the weird feeling that I've covered this subject before, don't worry, you're not going crazy. I just wasn't satisfied with that older video and decided to remake it. Anyway, without further ado, let's jump right in. Now, the first practical radio transmitters of the types developed in the 1880s and 1890s by the likes of Hertz, Marconi, Lodge, and others were called spark gap transmitters. And while the design and evolution of these transmitters is a bit beyond the scope of this video, in basic terms, the early transmitters used a combination of induction coil and interrupter circuit, similar to the ones used in the medical coils I covered in a previous video, link in the description, as well as a spark gap ground and antenna to send bursts of radio waves every time the signal key was depressed. However, the signals sent by these early transmitters were very noisy, very broad spectrum, and very low power, meaning that only one transmitter could be used within a certain area at any one time, and the signals couldn't travel very far. So later inventors added a capacitor to the circuit, turning it into a tuned resonant circuit that could be tuned to a much narrower band of frequencies, allowing for multiple transmitters to operate in the same area and the signals to carry farther. But again, that's beyond the scope of this video. And what we're interested in today is receivers. Now, the very first receivers for spark gap transmitters were based on a device called the coherer, invented in 1890 by French physicist Edouard Branly. And this consisted of a glass tube filled with fine iron filings with an electrode at either end. And a bias voltage was applied across the coherer and connected to a set of headphones. And when a burst of radio waves traveled through the coherer, it caused the iron filings to clump together or cohere, reducing their resistance and allowing a current to pass through the coherer to the headphones where they would appear as an audible click. Unfortunately, however, the iron filings would not automatically reset, meaning that this effect on its own was only good for receiving one signal. So coherers were fitted with a mechanism called a decoherer, which was an electromagnetic hammer that tapped the coherer after each signal, resetting the iron filings and allowing the coherer to receive a new signal. Yet despite being the first practical radio receiver, the coherer was not very sensitive or reliable. So in 1902, Marconi invented a superior type of receiver called the magnetic hysteresis detector, often nicknamed the MAGI. So this consisted of a thin band of iron or bundle of smaller iron wires driven around a pair of pulleys by a clockwork or electric motor. Mounted above the band was a pair of horseshoe magnets that would impart a magnetic field into the band in one direction and then the other. And then wrapped around the middle were two coils, an excitation coil attached to the receiver's antenna and a pickup coil attached to the headphones. Now normally the spot on the iron band where the magnetic field reversed appeared to be stationary, so no signal was picked up by the pickup coil. However, when a signal was picked up by the antenna and conveyed to the excitation coil, the induced magnetic field would cause this reversal spot to move rapidly up the band, and this rapidly moving magnetic field would induce a current in the pickup coil, which would be picked up as a tone on the headphones. And this quickly became the standard detector for spark gap radio sets. And because it was less sensitive to vibration than the coherer, it was especially popular aboard ships, and indeed it was part of the wireless equipment of the Titanic. However, spark gap transmitters, coheres, and magnetic detectors were only really suitable for wireless telegraphy, that is, the sending of more signals via interrupted carrier waves. They could not be used to transmit voice or other audio signals via modulated carrier waves. For that, you needed different technology. Now, the development of practical amplitude modulated, or AM, broadcasting is usually attributed to Canadian-born inventor Reginald Fessenden, who's credited with broadcasting the first program of music and entertainment over the airwaves from Brent Rock, Massachusetts, on Christmas Eve 1906. Now, Fessenden's transmitter consisted of a high-speed alternator to produce a pure sine wave, which you could then modulate using a carbon microphone, while his receiver looked like this. And this is what is known as a parallel tuned circuit, which consists of an LC circuit connected between an antenna and ground. 
Now, an LC circuit consists of a capacitor and an inductor, the latter designated L because I was already taken to denote current. And when voltage is applied to an inductor, the energy is stored in the coils as a magnetic field. When that voltage is removed, the field collapses and the energy is converted into a current that flows into the capacitor, which converts the energy into an electric field stored between the plates. This field then collapses and the current flows back into the inductor and the process repeats again. And this creates an oscillation at a particular resonant frequency given by this formula. And this resonant frequency can be adjusted or tuned by varying either the inductance or the capacitance. And we'll look at how that's done in just a little bit. Now, a key property of this type of circuit is that the closer you tune it to the radio frequency that you wish to receive, the higher its impedance, that is its resistance to alternating current. This means that any signals outside of a very narrow band that are received by the antenna are sent directly to ground. It is only around that desired resonant frequency that the impedance becomes so high that the signal is instead passed to the detector and the headphones. And so the circuit acts as an RF filter, rejecting all but the desired band of frequencies. However, even when your receiver circuit is properly tuned, you can't just connect your headphones directly to it. This is because the received signal is still an AC sine wave and the average voltage is zero. So if you connect your headphones up, you will hear nothing. And that is why these types of receivers require an additional component called a detector. And this is a component more generally known as a rectifier or diode that only allows current to pass in one direction. And this basically cuts off the bottom of the sine wave and allows you to hear the signal. And since the signal is encoded in the varying amplitude of the carrier wave, you can visually represent it by drawing a line or an envelope over the top of the waveform. This is why this type of rectifier in this application is also known as an envelope detector. Now, Fessenden developed two different types of detectors for his radio receivers. The first was called a hot wire barrier, and this consisted of a very fine piece of platinum cord silver wire, aka Williston wire, encased in a glass envelope. Now a bias voltage was applied to this to heat the wire up to a temperature where its thermal resistance would be the most variable. And then this was connected to the antenna of the receiver. And when the signal from the antenna was passed through the barrier, the fluctuating current would cause the wire to heat up and cool down, causing its resistance to fluctuate and causing the current in the bias circuit to fluctuate as well. And this would be picked up as an audible signal in the headphones. And the wire's thinness was such that it was fast enough to respond to audio frequency signals, but not fast enough to respond to radio frequency signals, meaning that it was able to demodulate AM signals. However, just like the Cohere, the barrier was not very sensitive or reliable, so Fessenden developed another detector called the Electrolytic Detector. This consisted of a thin platinum wire whose tip was dipped into a cup of dilute sulfuric acid. There was another electrode on the bottom of the cup, and these two electrodes were connected to a bias voltage as well as to the resonant circuit and antenna. So what would happen here is that the current would electrolyze the water, causing bubbles of hydrogen or oxygen to form on the tip of the platinum wire. Now, when current traveled through the detector in one direction, it would cause more bubbles to form, forming an insulating sheath over the end of the wire, increasing the resistance and preventing current from flowing in that direction. Whereas if the current flowed in the other direction, the hydrogen and oxygen would be recombined into the water, the sheath would shrink, and the resistance would be reduced as well, allowing current to pass in that that direction. Now, as you can imagine, none of these detectors was particularly practical, especially if you wanted to build a robust and portable radio receiver. Thankfully, however, back in 1874, a German inventor named Ferdinand Braun had discovered that several minerals, including copper sulfide, exhibit rectifying properties when placed in close contact with metals. Now, in 1901, the Indian physicist Jagadish Chandra Bose patented the first so-called crystal detector, while in 1911, an American inventor with the delightful name of Greenleaf Whittier Pickard patented what became known as the Cat's Whisker Detector, which became the standard detector for crystal radios for several decades. Now, to show you how this works, I'm going to use this crystal radio set generously sent to me by the fine folks over at United Nuclear. And if anybody from the company is watching, I can't thank you enough. This was such a lovely surprise to find in my mailbox. I'm completely humbled and I just, I love the community that's built up around this channel. I've said it many times before. 
And for everybody else, if you haven't already, go check out their website. They've got a lot of really neat things as well. And I've actually covered some of their products on this channel before, including the spintharoscope and a sample of Trinitite. Anyway, this crystal radio set has all of the components that we've already discussed. We have our coil or inductor here. We have a variable capacitor under this tuning knob. We have terminals for the antenna and the ground. And we have our headphones, or in this case, a piezoelectric earpiece. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are two ways of tuning an LC circuit. One is to vary the inductance. The other is to vary the capacitance. Now, in certain models of crystal radios, what you're instructed to do is sand away a strip of insulation on the coils here, making sure not to short out any of the coils. And then you'll have a sliding contact that allows you to tap the coil at various positions, thus varying its inductance. You can also have an iron core sliding in and out of the inductor, which we saw used in my video on medical coils. However, the most common way of tuning a crystal radio is with a variable capacitor, which is hidden underneath this knob, but I can show you an example here where this consists of two stacks of semicircular metal plates interleaved with one another so that there is an air gap between all of the plates. And as you turn the knob, you are interleaving them more or less, increasing or decreasing the total surface area of the plates and thus varying the capacitance of the capacitor. Now, in terms of connecting up this radio, what amateurs will typically do is drive a long metal stake into the ground outside, or they'll connect the radio to the middle screw inside of an electrical outlet or the cold water pipe. Though in the latter case, you need to make sure that you don't have a newer house with plastic cold water pipes underneath because that won't work. Also, never connect this to the gas line or you might have a bad day. And as for the antenna, typically you can use a very long piece of wire strung out the window to a tree or the fence or say the fire escape of an apartment building. Basically, any large conductor will do. And finally, we get to our detector, which in this case is a crystal of germanium, though several different materials were used over the decades, including iron pyrite, silicon, and lead sulfide or galena, as in this cat's whisker detector from the 1930s. And so what you were supposed to do to set up your radio was to hunt over the surface of the crystal with the cat's whisker until you found a spot that rectified the signal. And this works by forming what is known as a metal semiconductor junction. Now, the physics of this are fairly complicated and a bit beyond the scope of this video, but modern diodes will use what's known as a PN semiconductor junction. So depending on what impurities are added to a semiconductor like silicon or germanium, you can turn it into either a P-type or an N-type semiconductor. So an N-type has an excess of electrons and thus negative charge, while a P-type has a deficiency of negative charge and thus an abundance of positive charge, often known as poles because they are where an electron should be. Now, if you sandwich an N and a P-type semiconductor together, electrons from the N-type will flow into the P-type, producing something called a depletion zone with no free electrons. Now, if you apply a positive voltage to the P side of this junction, that is, you forward bias it, then the excess electrons in the N layer will allow current to flow freely through the diode. However, if you reverse bias the diode, that is, you apply a positive current to the N side, then the depletion layer will grow and act as a resistor, preventing current from flowing in that direction. And metal semiconductor junctions work in a similar fashion, producing a potential energy barrier to reverse bias current flow known as a Schottky barrier. Now, while nearly all modern diodes are of the PN type, metal semiconductor junctions are actually preferred for use in crystal radios because of something called forward voltage drop. That is the minimum voltage needed to get a current to flow through the rectifier. Now, for a regular PN diode, this is around 0.6 volts, Whereas for a metal semiconductor junction, depending on design, this can be as low as 0.15 to 0.46 volts, allowing this detector to detect weaker signals and be used at longer ranges. Now, as you can imagine, fiddling with your cat's whisker detector, as well as trying to tune the radio to desired frequency, is something of a juggling act. So what a lot of radio amateurs using crystal radios had was a buzzer, which was an oscillator that operated at a particular known frequency. So what the operator could do was tune the radio to that known frequency and then play around with their cat's whisker until they heard that signal. 
then they could move on to tuning their radio to whatever signal that they wanted to receive. Now, given the rather fiddly nature of the cat's whisker detector, it wasn't long until inventors came up with more robust and convenient crystal detectors. So, for example, in 1904, Henry Dunwoody came up with a piece of carborundum squeezed between two metal plates that needed no adjustment, while in the same year, Greenleaf Pickard came up with a similar detector based on silicon. And two years later, Pickard came out with yet another type of detector he called the Paracon, which is short for Perfect Pickard Contact. So great inventor, not so great with acronyms. And this used two crystals pressed up against one another rather than a metal semiconductor junction. Pickard's original detector used zinc oxide or zincite and copper iron sulfide in the form of bornite or chalcopyrite, though later versions used a number of materials including carbon, galena, tellurium, silicon, arsenic, and antimony. One drawback of the system was that high currents tended to burn out the zincite, so early Paracon detectors featured multiple crystals mounted on a turntable so a burnt out crystal could be quickly replaced. So the development of crystal detectors allowed for the production of reliable, portable, and inexpensive radio receivers. And this democratized radio and led to the rise of the commercial broadcasting industry. And here I have a great example of a commercial crystal radio set from the heyday of the technology. This is a British aerial set from around 1923, and this was sold by the mail order service JG Graves Limited, based in Sheffield. And aside from coming in a very nice wooden box, in terms of the circuit, this is almost identical to the United Nuclear set that we just looked at. So we have our crystal detector in the back here, a cat's whisker type inside of a glass tube. We have a tuning knob in the front, which is connected to a variable capacitor. And we have terminals for the headphones, the antenna or aerial, and the ground or earth. And this does have an inductor, but that's hidden underneath this cover. And we'll look at that in just a second. Now, by this point in the video, you're probably wondering, well, where are the batteries? How does this radio get its power? And that is the beautiful thing about crystal radios, that they do not require any power source because they derive all their power from the signal that they're receiving through the antenna. And this made them very useful for people living in rural areas. Remember that even in North America, many areas weren't electrified until well into the 1950s and 1960s. So with a crystal radio, a farmer could listen to reports on the price of grain or weather reports and get other useful information without needing to bother with batteries or having his farm electrified. But since these radios operate on such minuscule amounts of power, it is vital to optimize the circuit to eliminate or at least minimize all potential sources of loss, such as resistive losses. Now, in an ordinary DC circuit, this is easily done by increasing the diameter of the conductors. The problem with high-frequency AC circuits, however, is that the currents exhibit something called the skin effect, where the electrons will flow close to the surface of the conductor. This makes most of the inside of the conductor useless and reduces the conducting cross-sectional area, increasing resistance. So the way that this is usually dealt with is by making all of the conductors out of so-called Litz wire, which consists of many smaller conductors all bundled together. Now, another common source of loss in crystal radios is the so-called proximity effect. And this is a phenomenon whereby the magnetic field induced by adjacent turns of wire in the inductor cause the electrons to flow within a very narrow band between those two wires. And this also increases resistance and reduces efficiency. Now, there are a number of ways of dealing with this problem. And what this radio opts to do is make use of a so-called spiderweb coil, in which the wire is wound in such a way as to place subsequent turns as far away from each other as possible, minimizing the proximity effect. You can also see our rather large variable capacitor on the other side of the top plate. Now, another thing to point out when it comes to the optimization of crystal radios is that these sets require headphones with high impedance. So old headphones like this or a piezoelectric earpiece like the one we saw on the United Nuclear Crystal set. You can't use modern low impedance hi-fi headphones because the rest of the circuit is so high impedance that it will dissipate most of the audio signal before it even reaches the headphones. Now, collectively, all of these optimizations are going to maximize what's known as the circuit's quality factor, or Q. So I mentioned near the beginning that when you apply a voltage to an LC circuit and then remove it, the energy is going to shuttle back and forth between the inductor and the capacitor at a certain resonant frequency. Now, of course, due to resistive and other losses, this wave is going to be damped as the energy is bled off. 
and Q is a dimensionless ratio between the energy at the start and the energy loss after one radian of the cycle. The higher the Q, the less damped the oscillation is, and the more sensitive and efficient the circuit, and thus the weaker the radio signals that you can detect. And indeed, with a properly optimized crystal radio, you can detect commercial AM broadcasts out to around 60 kilometers, or a little bit more. So this has been significantly reduced over the years since the advent of far more sensitive tube and transistor-based receivers has allowed broadcast stations to transmit at lower power. Though, of course, higher frequency shortwave transmissions, which bounce off of the Earth's ionosphere, can propagate for thousands of kilometers, and these can be detected with a properly designed crystal radio. Now, the extreme simplicity of crystal radio sets make them ideal for construction under conditions where resources are limited. So, for example, during the Second World War, soldiers in the field, POWs in camps, and civilians in occupied territories often built what are known as foxhole radios. And in all these cases, crystal radios had the advantage that unlike regular heterodyne receivers, they didn't give off any signals of their own, and thus could not be homed in on and targeted by the enemy. Now, a foxhole radio typically consisted of an inductor, a ground, and antenna made out of scrap wire, as well as some sort of detector. And one of the most common detectors used a regular razor blade with a blue oxide finish, with the cat's whisker being improvised from something like a safety pin with a piece of graphite from a pencil attached to the end. And you would use this like a regular cat's whisker detector hunting over the surface of the razor blade with the graphite until the two formed a metal semiconductor junction and rectified the signal. Another common type of foxhole radio detector consisted of the carbon rod from a dry cell battery balanced on a pair of razor blades. Now, you're probably wondering at this point, well, where's the capacitor? Doesn't this type of circuit need a capacitor? And yes, it does. But unfortunately, this was a very difficult component to improvise in the field. But thankfully, with a properly designed antenna, this would supply all the capacitance that the circuit needed. And so in order to tune the circuit, you would need to vary the inductance of the inductor using a sliding path. By this time in the 1940s, however, crystal radios were otherwise largely obsolete. This is because these radios operated at such low power that they could only be listened to using headphones. They really couldn't be broadcast over a loudspeaker without a separate amplifier. And this is why in the late 1920s and early 1930s, crystal radios were largely replaced by more sophisticated heterodyne and regenerative radios that were not only more sensitive, but also included amplifiers that allowed the broadcast to be transmitted over loudspeakers. And it turned listening to the radio into more of a communal activity. And despite this, crystal radios continued to be built by hobbyists and were often a popular first project for children to learn the basics of radio technology. And fully assembled radios were sold as children's toys, and I have a very neat example of that here. This is a rocket radio made by the Miniman Radio Company Limited of Japan in the 1950s and 1960s. And there were a number of different variants of this design. Some were like traditional rockets that sat on their tails, Others were more like sci-fi spaceships like this one that sat horizontally, though the internal circuitry was pretty much the same. So on the outside here, we have our piezoelectric earpiece, we have our grounding clamp, and a sliding nose cone which tunes the radio, and this is really our only control. If we open this up, we can see that inside we have a germanium diode, a capacitor, and an inductor or coil. And the circuit is tuned by sliding this metal core in and out of the coil to vary its inductance. So looking inside here, you're probably wondering now, well, where's the antenna? Well, earlier versions of the rocket radio did have a second clamp in addition to the ground clamp, which you could attach to any large conductor, a fire escape, or a long wire to form your antenna. However, the design was eventually refined to the point where an antenna was no longer necessary. The Q of this circuit, its sensitivity is so high that using only this little coil here, it can detect signals out to 50 miles or 80 kilometers, as stated on the box. Though, of course, this depends strongly on the power of the transmitter. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and a huge shout out to Julian Horn, who was again invaluable in putting together the research for this video, and to United Nuclear for very generously supplying this crystal radio set. I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more radio technology and other fascinating devices just like these. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.